Okay, guys. So, small little sugiyar and dafe. So let's let's wrap up what we're going to see of Dina Devar Metzor. So the Gemara here was telling two stories between Ronya and Ravina. So I know someone asked me, what is Ronya? The answer is not what is Ronya, but who is Ronya? Who is Ronya? And his name is Ronya. That's what we know. Yes. So Ronya is of an ara amateur de Ravina. Ra- Ravina, uh, Ronya bought land next to Ravina, on the border of Ravina. Savar Ravina le saluke mishum dina de barmetra. And Ravina wanted to kick him out because of dina de barmetra. And Amar le Rav Safra, so, so far, great. Then the Gemara has this line that nobody knows what it means, which is why we have a muffle get Rashi tells us. So what is, happens? Amar le Rav Safra, braid de Rav Yeba le Ravina. Amri insha arba'a litsala arba'a litsalala. Something, something, something. Four for something and four for something. That's, that is like, that is the extent of what we have, right? That is the Gemara. And this is why Rashi and Dosa want to know what's going on. Because apparently it's supposed to tell us something profound about Dina de Baretra, But no one knows what it means. So, Rashi has several possibilities. So I know you guys struggled through it, but let's, let's work through Rashi. So we have to do two things. One is just Pshat, which is, what does, these are, by the way, some of the hardiest, hardest Gemaras in the world. Within the Gemara, when the Gemara's Lumdish answer is an idiom that hasn't been in currency for 1,500 years or more, it does make it complicated to figure out what's going, going on, right? Um, so what does Rashi say? Rashi says, Ani Shamati. Now, even Rashi wasn't sure. So what does Rashi say? I've heard, right? I have heard that this is what it means. Salah. What is it, Salah? So he argues, Ratzan. A leather worker of sorts. Ani, who's poor. Vitsalila, Ratzan Ashir. And Salah, according to him, means the same thing, just a rich one. There's a poor and a rich leather worker of sorts. Vikach Amarlo. So what did he say to him? Arba ki karot srichen l'ratan ani l'ma'achalot beito l'yo. Kimo should srichen l'ashir. Both a poor and a rich leather worker need four loaves of bread to, to feed their family. Vize anihu. And now the point of the idiom for him is that um... Rav Safra says to Ravina, Ronya is poor. Ronya is poor. And he needs this field to make the money. And just like you want to claim the right to kick him off the field, because he shouldn't have bought it, you're the neighbor. But why? Because of Dina de Bar Metro, which itself is predicated on Valsita Yasher Vato. Ani Omer Lecha, I'm telling you, Asei Yashar Vitov L'An Yizev Al Tisal Kehu. Do the Yashar Vato, do the right thing, and don't kick him off. And then he says, the Yish Lagam game, right? You can be a... Uh, Right, you can stutter, meaning you can be unsure about this shot. The or kari sala ratan, because technically sala is leather, not a leather worker. Kedamrin ba'alma, my dargash, arsa de sala, like the Gemara Nedarim, when it's trying to figure out different types of beds and couches and stools and benches and whatever. So a dargash is one of them made of leather. Um, so therefore, Rashi says, it. alternative shot Omer Ani Runya Rats Anhaya Vinotin Orot La Avdinan La Asot Mehen Minalim La Mochan Bashuk. Alternatively, he says that Runya was a, a leather worker who used to take his leather and use and have them made into shoes to sell them. Because Omer La Rav Safra La Ravina and Rav Safra said, Haani Azes Charo Muot Shut Tarvli Dem Char Arbe La Avdanin. And he, what he was saying was, look, Runya doesn't make a lot of money. Why? Because he has this, the, the phrase means 
To make shoes, you got to spend four whatever currency. Yeah. Welcome. Four. What are you doing here, by the way? Not that I, I'm not that I'm not happy to see you, but what are you doing here? Okay, well, you have to keep your mask on the whole time, come on. Yes. Um, so he says, in order to make shoes, it costs four whatever currency for the leather and another four to the leather workers to make it into shoes. And therefore, how much money is left for the leather worker? Very little. I mean, I don't know how much the leather, I don't know how much, you know, money he makes, but therefore he said, look, let the guy have a break and let him have some money, right, a second source of income from the field. That's shot two. The linear up shot three, which is Rashi's preferred, is arba litsala, which means arba kikarot sarich la'abidan ani, you need four loaves of bread for the leather worker who's poor. So Pshat 3 is as follows. Um, so as we, we didn't yet see this again, but in the previous again, you, you find out that Runya and Ravina actually were, were neighbors in general. And what happened, that um, Runya had one field which was a within the field of Ravina, because Ravina had surrounded him on four sides. And now he fi- buys another field on the border of Ravina, which is technically not his, which technically doesn't border his field. And therefore, technically, R- Ravina is the bar mitzvah. But he says, still, having two fields close to each other is better than having them far away even if they're not adjacent. So technically, he doesn't have the din of Bar Metra, but the same similar advantages that would accrue that generate the principle of din of the Bar Metra are applicable here, even though technically you are the Bar Metra and he is not. But look, stretch it and let him have those advantages because he's poor and he really needs it. Okay? So what's the common denominator between all three, and then we'll talk about the differences. What's the common denominator between all three answers in Rashi? Uh, you, this whole thing Very right. Meaning Rashi thinks that the common denominator to Rashi is that r- there's some reason that Runya is poor and therefore needs this field more than Ravina. And even though by the strict letter of the law of Dina Varmet to Ravina deserves the field, he's told by Rav Safra to give it to Runya. Why? So, I remember we talked about, now let's go back to day one. We said there are three main ways of thinking about the relationship between the Dinah of Dinah Bar Metzrah. One is that it's mere descriptive and there is no such law, thing as a law of Dinah Bar Metzrah. It's just an articulation of the value. That we suggested was maybe the Havamina and the Gemara Bav, or the Shito and the Gemara Bav and Messiah, that you, if someone violates Dina de Bar Metra, there's nothing you can do about it. Right? Um, but then we said, okay, but that's not the conclusion. In the end, we hold that you can remove him, and that you need a Kenyan to give up, the right Yoho needs to do a Kenyan with Ezra to give up his rights to the field, implying that this is actual law. Then we said, even if you think it's law, it can be law in one of two ways. It can be a normal law, and normal law, while it may be motivated by certain values, becomes independent of it, and under certain circumstances can even be counterproductive 
to the stated purpose of the law. Right? We, know, we all know that's true. Right? We all know that there are the cases where a law was instituted for a reason, and 90% of the time it either accomplishes that goal or is at least neutral with regards to the goal. But there are cases in which it's counterproductive. Right? Um, speed limits. Right? Speed limits are meant to make driving more safe. Often they do that. Sometimes lomala vilomorid, right? But sometimes, right, if you if the person behind you isn't keeping the law and is telling you, right, if you don't speed up and go beyond the speed limit, it's actually more dangerous, but technically the police can still give you a ticket if they happen to catch you and not the person behind you. You might get off by saying, well, you know, the guy behind me was telling me and it was dangerous and maybe you're right and maybe they'll listen to you, but they don't have to, right? Yes, and therefore you will say, look, right, if I would, right, you'll say that if I go faster, right, if you, if you tell the, right, if you tell the cops, look, in the end of the day, there was nobody ahead of me for, for, a, for a kilometer, but there was this one guy who was telling me, so it was clearly safer for me to speed up and go 20 miles above the, the speed limit, right? They may accept that, but they don't have to, right? They could say, okay, too bad, right? If They could say that if I had found the guy behind you doing that, so I could have f given him a ticket, but I didn't, I saw you, right? Or whatever. Even though in that case, we could say admittedly that the speed limit was counterproductive to safe driving. So you could conceptualize in the relationship to the the same way that it's meant to accomplish its goal. Sometimes it does, sometimes it's neutral, and sometimes it's counterproductive. That's one model. The other is to say, no, this is a unique type, unique type of law. It's a law where the value is still integrated into the law, and the motivation has not been divorced from the application of the law. What happened? I, I figured. Wait. Okay, I know. I know. I Look, Yonatan, I understand. I really, I get it. I really do. I do. I, I may seem like I don't care, you know, but I do. Yes. Can I, let me just finish my formulation and then I'll dig it, right? But then there's the possibility that my CDU Ashramento and DMR Metro are unique in that the law can, must always answer to its value, right? So, uh, so um, let me, let's go back to the speed limit case. Let's say, right, you can imagine someone saying that you're not allowed to speed unless the person behind you is telling you and it's more dangerous. You could imagine a country having that law. I don't know if any country actually has that law. I have no idea. But you can imagine someone saying that you should, you can't, you have to keep to the speed limit when it keeps you safe or even when it's neutral, but in a case where that's the only way to protect yourself. I know it would be a near possible, it would be far too easy for any person to do so. That's why I'm saying I don't know if any country actually has that law, but I'm saying in theory, you could imagine someone saying that. Good. So, Yonatan, what were you going to ask? Yes. Yeah, so, why do we Why was it rejected? You could, but the Gemara seems not to. Because the Gemara, remember that was what we suggested was a machloket in the Gemara as to whether once the neighbor doesn't buy the product, someone else buys it, are you allowed to remove them? What, if you're allowed to remove them, can't you say you're removing the greater law of... You could, but normally we don't, you, we don't enforce, right? We don't enforce things that are not law. Right? At the end of the day, you need a law because you need something, right? You need something hard on the books. Not just... Yeah, right. Meaning, in the end of the day, look. In the end of the day, we might think that it's really bad for you to stand by and watch as somebody gets mugged. Okay, I think we can all agree that that's bad. But unless you live in a state, and I think this is state by state, that actually has a good Samaritan law on the books, 
right, which requires you to intervene if possible, you, you know, you might not uh, be the model member of society, but, but they can't prosecute you, yeah. right? You know, you're definitely too young for this. Definitely too young for this. I'm basically too young for this. But I remember my parents caring about this when I was probably still young. But the last episode, the, the series finale of Seinfeld was apparently on this point. Okay, you're not too young for it. I feel like I'm too young for it. But is, is this, of, of, of the main characters being tried and imprisoned for violating the Good Samaritan law, for not intervening in some crime, which I don't even know what it is, but I remember my parents, I remember distinctly my parents watching it. And like... Somebody got lost and took a video and they Yeah, there you go. Right? But, but again, if you, don't have a, if you don't have a Good Samaritan law in the books, then you can't punish people. You can, yeah, you won't, you know... You won't honor them as model members of society, but you can't punish them. But if you have a good Samaritan law in the books, then you can. And at the end of the day, enforcement requires law. Right? Again, nobody thinks that someone callously standing by and filming a mugging rather than intervening is a nice thing to do. <laughs> nobody. And if anyone does think that, you're a terrible person. I'm just saying. Um, but uh, no one thinks that. Oh, wait, but Paul here, is, is, is Jonathan the only one who knew about this episode? It's a generational thing here on Seinfeld. I don't know. I, I don't watch Seinfeld either. I like what? Yeah, I was I was in I mean I was still in elementary school when the, when it finished. That's what I'm saying. It's not really my generation. Like like Aura really liked it. Like there are people my age who are like Seinfeld fans, but it wasn't really like Yeah, <laughs> You know, I mean, look, I, you know, I know that Ad Hayom, it's like one of the most popular things ever, and <laughs> I don't fully understand why it's not my case. But he has the money to show for it, so like, you know, he's consistently like the richest person in Hollywood because of it. Anyway, um, fine. So, uh, guys, so Rashi clearly on the thinks that Dina de Marmetra, if it is law, it's a law where we haven't, we care about the value that motivated the law, and therefore, in a case in which the law is contradictory to its motive, then we follow the motivation rather than what should otherwise be the law in the books. I mean, he doesn't think this is a law that is now on the books and has Right, left its motivation behind. It's a law that is answerable. The motivation is part of its application. Right? Correct. Meaning, meaning, this isn't a law that, like I said, this is a law in which it may apply even in neutral cases, but it will never apply in negative cases because we still care about the motivation in its application. Right? This is not just a philosophical principle that motivated the law, it's a juridical principle. Yeah. Right, if we want to use formal language. Right? It's part of the law itself. Don't show right. Meaning it's actually part of it, right? The motivation actually affects the application. Now, the first two explanations of Rashi, I have nothing more to say on in that regard. The third one is interesting because Rashi's preferred explanation is slightly more complex than that, which is right. The, uh, kind of paper, yeah, exactly. Meaning in the first two, Rashi it suggests that, look, even if the guy has no claim which looks anything like the Dina de Bar Mesra, right, he just is a poor person and the nice thing to do is to let him have the field, so let him have the field. And if Rashi understands his third answer to the exclusion of the first two, then Rashi is a little bit more complicated, right, because Rashi sounds like in the third answer that, hmm, yeah, exactly. It's maybe, right, in the third answer, you have to wonder that maybe Rashi will say, look, for some niceness, I'm not going to tell you you're allowed to go against the, the rules on the book of Dina de Bar Mesra. But if it's a question of stretching and fudging Dina de Bar Mesra in favor of Atizir Eshratov, so I'll tell you to fudge Bar Mesra in favor of the motivating law of Marvet. So that, that's a more subtle claim, right? Because that's not saying that general niceness 
which is a motivating factor, will let you override the laws in the book of Dinah Baruch It's saying, if you're the, you're the neighbor, but the other person is like two doors down, which is like, yeah, that's not neighborhood, but it's in the same ballpark. It's in the same neighborhood, yes, thank you. It's in the same neighborhood of, uh, of cases, so then the fact that he's Masisa Rashi Vatelv is behind the law, that's enough to say, you know, fudge it in favor of the meta value that motivates this law in the first place. And that's a much less extreme formulation than the first two. Yeah? Why don't you say that it's a the Uh, so you tell me. Yeah. Right? Why wouldn't you? Why, Imkvar, why wouldn't you take the first two opinions of Rashi? Because the law is law and you can't just. So one, right. So one possibility is that, you know. Oh, okay, wait, wait, wait a second. So one possibility is that at the end of the day, it's just the burden of law. Right? Law in general has to have a little bit of formality. So it's one thing to say that it's a law that takes into account broader principles if, like, it sort of looks like the general law. It's another thing to say that, well, the purpose of this law is to be nice. And therefore, anything, you know, if you should be nice in any way that is totally unrelated to the law, that should override this formalized version of Aziz and Asherasim. I assume that that's part of what's motivating Rashi. The other possibility could just be a, it could just be a quantitative thing. That Rashi thinks it has to be, right, that, you know, the particular benefits of Asisha Rashi Ratov expressed in Asisha Ratov are, uh, in Dindu Barmetra, are particularly strong. So, you know, general values of be nice to poor people, I mean, that's important. But, like, maybe it's just not strong enough, and it needs something which is, I don't know, I, I don't know. Look, let's go back to our look. Let's go back to our driving speed limit analogy, okay? okay. Ezra, I, I see you. One second. Oh, you want to respond to him? Yeah. Okay, go. Then go respond. Um, so the idea of seeing uh, the seeing the speed limit is that there is a subjective value to having land. Uh, there's a uh, there's a uh, there's a there's a there's a subject value to having land close to your own, and that that value only applies to the neighbor. If someone doesn't own any land and is just moving in, they don't get anything out of that, and therefore you should prioritize that prioritize maxing at that value. So, and the idea is that that person can just buy land somewhere else where no one else. Uh, no one, none of the neighbors there actually want it. So instead of having, instead of having, um, having um, the person, the neighbor who wants to buy the land, um, his only option is to buy property all the way over there and have two extremely far away things you want, and you, it's better to be able to group things. So if you're saying that, um, unless, uh, if you're saying that, why does it matter that he's poor? Because just like for other people, you say, okay, you can just buy it somewhere else because, and that, that value, that method is, would be equally valuable for you, but there's an added value to this land for support specifically for the neighbor. That doesn't just because you're poor doesn't make a difference in that because you can just buy land in another place. So therefore you'd have to say that you that therefore Ross you might feel that you have to say that that there is a level of subjective right. in this case. Right. So I agree with you, right? Meaning that Rashi in the end of the day seems to be motivated by recognizing a certain uniqueness to the type of kindness. And the the logic behind this particular manifestation of the kindness, and that's why he might need something similar because it's again it's hard to just say well you should be nice so therefore give up on this right this particular you know universally recognized value but to say that well his value is similar so then you should take into account like on the margins look it's, let's go back to our driving case you could see a law where they would say we're willing to accept. I, again, I don't know if any country has this law, but you could see someone willing to accept, I'll let you speed, right? I'll accept an excuse that you sped because it was dangerous for you not to speed because someone was telling you, but I won't accept a law where I'll let you off from speeding 
um, because you really wanted to. Well, okay, that's not even like a chesed. Like that's not, but you really wanted to make it to the hospital because someone you were close to was either needed you or was dying. You wanted to make sure you would get there in time. Right? You weren't saving their life. Saving their life is usually a, right? But whatever, you wanted to visit the person and, and it would really make a difference to their psychological well-being. You wouldn't save their life, right? Or if someone was dying, you cared about it, and you really wanted to make the hospital, you couldn't save their life, but it would be emotionally satisfying, right? You could see a law where they would say, look, I totally understand why you were speeding, but in the end of the day, you broke the law, right? And you could see someone saying, look, I'm willing to accept you sped because it made the driving safer, because that, at least, you were, you know, you were violating the law in service of protecting the very value that the law was there to promote, which was safe driving. But as much as I might recognize the moral weight of you trying to get to the hospital, short of actual Pikuach Nevis, where you're the person who's been able to save that person's life, I, I, I can't just let you get away with speeding, right? Again, you could, you could imagine a system where they would, and that's the first Judaism in Rashi, right? Right? I mean, the first two are basically saying if there's any external value, right, you could say, okay, be kind in that way, be kind in this way, right? Be kind to the poor person. It doesn't have to be a related value. It doesn't have to be a related... No, I don't think so, right? They're more, they're more on yours, right? Because there, you're helping the poor person, right? You're saying help the poor person, not in any way that resembles Dina de Barmestra. Yeah, it resembles the further, the more overarching law. Correct, that's like the hospital case, right? Where we want to protect lives in general. So like people's mental, right? People's psychological well-being or having their loved ones near them when they're sick or when they're dying, that's also part of how we take care of society. Right? So you're speeding to do that. So like, maybe it's legitimate to speed for that. Because they're like, very broadly speaking the same thing. As opposed to the third day where it's, no, 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 it's very similar. It's like, I'm speeding to drive, I'm speeding because that's the safer way of driving. Yeah, because I think that the, that the hospital can move on the overarching idea of the speed limit is to make driving safer. And nowhere, Correct, but Basis of Yashar is pretty wide, right? It's much more like be good, right? Yeah. Meaning it's, it's broader to begin with. So, yeah. so I, but I think that the first two formulations of Rashi would fall under that um, overarching. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, but we can quibble about how good my mashal is. My point is that, but my point is that, that mm-hmm. as much as Rashi in all three formulations believes, that Vasis Yashar is not just a motivator, but also is part of the application, yeah. the first two seem to think that but Sisha Rejav tells you to be nice. And therefore, if in this case, the nice thing to do is to give up on your rights, then you have to do that. The third day is saying, no, it's not enough to just say, well, Vasisha Rejav generically tells you to be nice, and the nice thing to do is not to give up your land. What it's saying is, if the way that we're asking you to be nice is similar to the specific way we ask you to be nice of Vasisha Rejav, even if it's not technically the letter of the law, so then I can tell you to give up on the letter of the law in favor of a related thing. But I can't just, you know, I can't go to the very meta layer because that's too abstract. That's too much like, right? That, that seems to be the machogat within Rashi. Yeah. Also, it, just, it feels like there, there is no real, there's no reason why being poor is, uh, of course, like the first definition, there's no real reason why being poor should be a preference to the life. Correct. The only, re- exactly. In the first two, Ezra is 100 percent right. Maybe the, maybe the better formulation is that in the first two, you're telling him, be nice to him, even though he has no claim in this land whatsoever. Simply because Vasisha Rejav itself tells you to be nice, and you have to be nice to poor people, regardless of whether it has anything to do with the land. The, right? And you're giving up on your own rights. In the third model, Rashi is saying, look, you may have a better claim to this land, but he doesn't have a technical claim to the land, but he does have a reason to want this land per se. And therefore, combine the fact that both of you have 
claims in the land. Admittedly, your claim is stronger, but his claim exists. Compound, right? Add to that the fact that you have an overarching value of helping the poor, and that is enough to push it over the edge that you should let him have it. But, but Ezra is right. In the latter formulation, Rashi thinks that only if the poor person, you should be nice to the poor person for reasons that resemble Dina Bar Metra, namely, that the niceness inheres in his right to this land, is Rashi willing to say that the value comes back and overrides the letter of the law, right? Because he also has a claim in the land in some way, shape, or form. But in the first two, you're just saying, be nice, even though you recognize he has no claim in the land. And that's really quite, right, that's extreme, because that's saying, even if Masizir Hashemat Tov is like the motivating value, but I, I totally ignore the fact that it has a particular form when it comes to the Marmetsa. The third one requires you to follow not just the overarching value, but its manifestation here, which is right, it's, it's instantiation here, where part of why you're supposed to be nice is because of a recognition of a preference for this land. In Rashi's formulation, he's saying, look, if you have the classic case of preference of this land, but he has a similar preference, plus there are extraneous values that push, so then you should give it to him. But that's a very, that's a much more limited claim. Yeah. Um, if we're going by the last formulation of Rashi, and there isn't like enough of a way or whatever to that you are uh, compelled by the lock of to mm-hmm. be like a kind of one of the four verses, would it still be like a better thing or an ideal for you to Again, that, that I don't know the answer to, right? You've asked me this several times and I don't know, right? Meaning, if you don't think someone has to do it, is it a nice thing to do? Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know. I don't know. According to Rashi, probably, right? Probably. Okay. What? Oh, good. So now, let, well, now let's talk to Tosvah. Tosvah goes to the opposite extreme. And really, all of Tosvah's can be summarized in Tosvah's first line, right? Which is... The Perish Akuntra's Mashkshe, right? On pe- Rashi's interpretation, meaning all three of them. Meaning all three of them, which imply that you should be a nice person and that that has any bearing on the law, right? What does Rabbi Adam say? We don't have mercy and justice. Done. End of story. Period. We're done, right? Before we even move on, what does Tosas' claim? Exactly. Right? Tosas' claim is much more radical or less radical, depending on your judicial thinking. I don't know. Okay? Uh, I, I honestly have no idea. If you have worked out judicial theories, you'll tell me which one is more likely and more radical in your opinion. I don't know. But his point is that even though this is a law with a stated goal, once Chazal made it into law, it is law. And law, sometimes, it usually is in service of, of its stated goal. Sometimes is neutral in terms of its motivation. But once in a while... It goes against the value, and there's nothing you can do. The law is the law is the law. What makes the law have staying power is that it is not reductionist to its values. It is law. Right? And at the end of the day, this is a very important idea in, in legal theory. Right? What makes it that someone can't claim, I ran the red light because I thought it was safe, because I saw that I had 50 feet before the next car, right, and I was safe, is the, the fact that you could also try him for running the red light at two in the morning when there's nobody there, right? It's the formality that protects it in the gray cloud cases, Do you know, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, meaning cases in which it's obviously dangerous to run the red light, no one's questioning the law. The, but... If you allowed people at 2 in the morning to run the red light, once you put that exception in, then people might run it when it's not 2 in the morning, and there are cars around, but they're, in his estimation, it's safe. The only way to reliably make sure that people know they're not allowed to make estimations, which may or may not be good, is to say that it's illegal to run a red light, even when, according to everybody, it's perfectly safe. Because by making it clear that this is the law, regardless of whether it makes any sense in this circumstance, you prevent the violation in gray cases, right? And that's just the way law works, 
And Tosot is saying, look, it's true that Vaisizir Hashemat motivated this law, but in the end of the day, by the time we get to the law, we have to vacate our desire to, we have to abandon our desire to talk about values, because at the end of the day, laws, even laws that are explicitly morally motivated, cannot be reduced when it comes to their adjudication to value. Right? That is Tosfos' claim. Correct. Now, according to Tosfos, I think it's very plausible. I, I don't know for Rashi. Yeah. For Tosfos, it, there's a good chance that Tosfos would say, but maybe the nice thing to do would be to do it, because Tosfos is saying, because Tosfos, Tosfos whatever Tosfos is saying, Tosfos is acknowledging that this is a mean thing to do. He's just saying, law has no mercy. But Tosfos seems to explicitly acknowledge that this is a mean thing to do. Right? It's just, you have the right to do it. Yeah. I think it also like, depends on which case, which case, like which version of Rashi. It could. Yeah, you're right. But yeah. but remember, Tosut is saying it's on all three days in Rashi. But you're right. It could be that in the third one, Tos. Yes, I think Ezra could be right. Then the first two cases, they might be different from the third. Then the third one, right? Tosut might say, look, he also has a claim. I'm not going to force you to do it, but it might be nice. In the first two, it's not clear because you might say that Tosut would say, look. Just because he's poor, so I'll give him stucca, right? I'll be nice in other ways, but why are you asking me to give up a legitimate claim in the land, right? I think Ezra's right. Then the first two days of Rashi, it's more likely that Tosu would say, no, 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 give the poor man stucca, but don't give him the field, right? Help him out in other ways. In the third formulation of Rashi, I don't know. He might say it's the right thing to do, yeah. It sounds like it's illegal because at least Tosos thinks that Rashi thinks it's illegal. Right. Right? Because right, Tosos at least understands Rashi that way. That's why his critique is in Rakhim Bedin. If all Rashi meant was this is the nice thing to do, but it's not enforceable, then Tosos has no claim against Rashi. So let's assume you're right. I can't prove it. Tosos, Rashi never says uh, explicit black on white that he's saying this on the level of law. He sounds like it, and Tosos understood in that way. But you're right. It could be that in the end of the day. Rashi is saying, legally, you don't have this claim, but it's the right thing to do. It's possible. I don't think, that's not how Tosa understood Rashi, and I think it's probably not what Rashi meant, but I can't prove that it's not what Rashi meant. You're right, Ezra. That is a, I'm glad you read closely enough to realize that Rashi doesn't explicitly not agree with Tosa. It's just that Tosa assumes that he doesn't agree. Yes. Um, Right, and he says, saluke ravina." It also sounds like Ravina was wrong. He has a whole bunch of questions, um, and therefore, what's Ravina Tam's actual interpretation? Right. So Rabbi Nitzam comes up with the following Kiddush. The case was where there's a field which Ravina borders on more sides than Runya, but they all border it. Okay? The Ava Gavdam Rabbi Kabbal on the Arba Benim Ezra the Kadim Chami and the Zavan my the Zavan Zavan Mikol Makom So Ravina was looking at Mishon Gaya Matzim Mishalosh Stadin. So normally, if you have four neighbors, you have a field in the middle and four different neighbors, so the halacha is that whoever gets there first wins. But Ravina thought that that's only where everyone is only a neighbor on one side. But if one person is a neighbor on three sides, and therefore it is much more advantageous for him to have the property rather than the person on the fourth side, then he gets it. Um, uh, so Amr le, so one second, so Amr le, let's just get through it. Amr le, Rav Safra, so he says, Amri insha arba litzala perish lor gadol tzar litin arba zuze, va arba litzala la or katan, lor tzar litin min akatan kmo min agadol shi ishtarach bakatan kmo bagadol. He says, look, 
In the end of the day, it's the same. It's like going to a dry cleaner, right? A dry cleaner, if he has a price for a suit, it doesn't matter if it's my kid's suit or my suit or someone who's significantly taller than my suit, which is most people, right? In the end of the day, the price is the price for dry cleaning, right? That's what he's saying. And therefore, though in his case, it's leather working, right? That you go to the leather worker and he charges you whatever he charges you because it takes the same amount of effort, whether it's a one meter or two meter. I don't know why. They throw it. At, I don't know why. It is what it is. Let's use dry cleaning for, this, for our purposes. And he's saying, just like by dry cleaning, whatever, however much work it takes, it takes, and that's the price, and that's all there is to it. So here too, Al-Khanami, my time in Dinah Bar-Metra, and he said the same thing is true here, because what's the rationale for Dinah Bar-Metra? Mishum shiyu kol sadadav smuchin shiachol lecharshan bevarachat. Because we want to make it easier for you to plow all your fields in one shot. Ulekach, who made some ruach achat, kmo shatam, mishach ruchot. And therefore, he wants to be able to plow his two fields together. You want to be able to plow your four fields together. But in the end of the day, it's, you have the exact same right. Because in the end of the day, you're going to have to travel to two places, or he's going to have to travel to two places. It doesn't matter. You have the exact same right to it. And just because you are boarded from more sides makes no difference whatsoever. He's also a neighbor. The Rav Ravinu Avram Perish. The Hach Ara Dezov and the Runya Ametra the Ravina Haino Ametra the Otan Zazaya Runya Aris Bahen. Ravinu Avram says, no, Ronya wasn't even an owner to this land. What was he? He was a sharecropper. Meaning, which means that Right, what's an aris? An aris is someone who has the right to a field for a significant period of time in return for, and his payment is a certain percentage to the actual owner. But therefore, he doesn't actually own it, but he does have a long-term relationship with the land. Um, and he said, um, he also has rights to it because it makes his sharecropping easier. And the mushal for this Dan Tosut means that to process leather, you have to pay four to the person who owns the leather and four to the person who works the leather. And therefore, the unit of our metro applies not just to people who technically have ownership of the land, but also to people who have consistent relations to the land as they work it, because both of them get the same benefit from the land. So, one second, let me just make a statement. The common denominator to both Deir and Toso is the claim that Dina de Marmetra is law, and for the purposes of the law, the motivation no longer matters. Meaning, Vasita Yashar Vatov is a philosophical principle, not a juridical one. Right? It makes no difference legally in the application of the law, it's only motivation. Do we agree that that is the common denominator between both Deus and Tosva? Right? As horrible as that may be to you, because how can you take a, a law predicated on the value of being nice and saying, even when it's the mean thing to do, court, the courts will give the right? I admit that that is true, but Tosa clearly is in that camp. So we now have seen Shito. What? So we, right, we now have seen, right, guys, so if you remember day one, I said this, that when we ask the question of the relationship between the value and the law, we can either say, there is no law, there's only articulated value, and therefore it's not enforceable, or it is enforceable, but it's one that integrates the value in some way or another, and that Rashi in different forms is on that line, it seems to be, at least it's supposed to understand it, and then there's Tozer who says, no, there's values, there's philosophical rationales, and then there's law. But once something is law, in Marachem and Medin, don't tell me the, the niceties that motivated this law. I don't care. The law is the law is the law. Whatever it says, it is. What motivated it, I don't care. Rami first, because Rami has been trying to say something, and then it's right, yeah.
doesn't say like what value they say. It says that these are uh, 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 what is alpha. So uh, it just seems to be meaning. Okay, you're right. Meaning maybe it's not nice. It's the just thing to do, and maybe you'll say this is the just thing to do once it's in the law. But the point is that it's not toes, right? Everyone's acknowledging that isn't the good thing to do here, but we, well, we can't, right? What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, as well. Okay, good. So now let's, so now let's, now that we have said what Toso agrees on, let's look at the two different answers. The first answer of Toso is pretty easy to understand. I mean, Tosa is saying, look, the Hava Amina was basically correct, that every inch of land that you have gives you more of a claim in the land. His, right? Exactly, right? His, his Kiddush is, right? And then Tosa is saying, no, no, no. Dinos of Armetra isn't the more you border it, the more you own it. It's simply, if you border it, then you have rights. That's it. Why? Because he said, the point was, if you border it, then you have good reason to want adjacent land. Well, That's it. That's for Tosa, the sum total of, of, of the Chesron, because it makes it easier for you to plow it together, to guard it together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if your field would be next to it, like a tiny little strip of land that would not make it easier at all, wouldn't that? Right. Maybe according to Tosa, that would be different. Okay. Correct. But he's saying, assuming that's not the case, right? This is just a perfect, yeah. right? Everyone has a full side that borders this middle property, yeah. right? So for everybody, it's now going to make their property contiguous with its expansion, right? So for everybody, you're right. For those we might have to ask interesting cases, like what if I have one inch that's sort of like just out, right? But really they're the, right? Like, <laughs> exactly. Very good. Exactly. If you gerrymandered the field, so maybe according to this, you'd have to ask. But assuming this is a perfect grid, right? So Tosa is saying, at the end of the day, sure, you might want to have your massive four four plot estate, but he wants his two plot estate, and both of you have equal rights to have a contiguous estate. It doesn't matter that for you it'll be four and for him it'll be two. In the end of the day, that's what you want. Okay? That's the first answer in Tosas, I think, is pretty straightforward conceptually. The second day in Tosas is fascinating, because the second day in Tosas thinks that... Yeah, so what about the sharecropper? So there's two different, right? I mean, it's not actually your land there. Very good. So, so you could have said, right, the Kiddush in Tosas is that the law was... Until now, we've assumed that this is about ownership. But now Tosas comes and says, now... Tosfut could have said the fact that you're a sharecropper shows that you do have some claim in the land itself. And, th and that's why you're being the Rameta. That would have been a good Kiddush. But Tosfut's actual claim is more radical than that. Because Tosfut says even though you ha don't have the Karka clue, you have no rights in the land at all. But Tosfut's Kiddush is that the way we formulated the law was not if you own land next to somebody else's land that you have rights, but it's he who has convenience, like a stated convenience in having two continuous pieces of land that he works, gets Dindar Marmetra. Now that's a huge kiddush, because that totally rewrites everything we thought about Dindar Marmetra, because it's no longer about ownership of land. It's he who works contiguous land has the right to the next land. That's all. Sure. Sure. Yes, this is a this is a, I will give it to you. It is, so, it is, it, a socialist might like this position in the sense that it grants more reality to the reality of labor than ownership with scare quotes. Yes, fine. If that makes you happy. Okay, that's fine. But, but I, I'm happy for you to like Rashi and say that you have found a position in test mode that might in some way grant I, I, like, I like the reasoning of social especially like uh, the end result that you wouldn't come to but I just I think three more okay that's fine okay um, yes that's fine so is it in this case is it going to be like um, work in one field and help not only really work in one field but only and work in the next one next to it or how no, no, the, the assumption that he's going to basically plow these two contiguous sure, together. Like, he's going to be sharecropping one and... And owning the other. And owning the other, correct. 
right? That's the bigger hiddish, right? Is that he, even though he's only a sharecropper, he, he can say, look, hey, I see my way out of <laughs> half of this, I admit, you could read it socialist in the sense that he's giving more value. But on the other hand, if you actually think what's going on here is that, no, the sharecropper is looking for ways of leaving his life of sharecropping and becoming a owner of the means of production. So maybe it is socialist. I don't know. Right? He's looking to own. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yes, he's living the American. No, that is exactly what it is. Right? Is that he? He's looking. Meaning, right? It's very clever. What's he saying, Ezra? Remember, that's exactly what, right. More realistically, what's happening is basically you're saying, look, right now the guy is a poor worker. Uh, whatever, but he has enough money to buy a field. But his but his way out of poverty is he scraped together enough money to buy the field, and now he's going to be able to work his own field and become an owner while still making money as an employee. Right? He's both a horrible capitalist landowner and the working class all at the same time. Very good. Okay, do what you want with this. Um, okay, Adam. Yes. That's a Tosa Zahavamina, yeah. Right, so why would it be more advantageous well, that, for the person that's the to get it? So I don't think it would be more advantageous. It's more that maybe he has more claim. And the answer is not, right? I think, I think that's actually the axis, right? Is that Tosa's answer is that it's about advantage. At the end of the day, you just have more property and less. But if it's about, if you, you could have had a Havamina that, look, Every inch that I border gives me more of a claim in the land, so I border more, so maybe I have more of a claim. Kamash no, it's about convenience, and in convenience, you both get our convenience by this. Maybe. No, I understand, but the guy in the, in the, in the bottom, you know, with, with only one land, now will be able to do it rather than having to travel somewhere else for his next property. I understand. There's more of an advantage because it advantages all his land. I, I get it. Yes. Um, okay. So as I noted at the bottom here, we have not exhausted this figure. There are many nafkaminas to this question, but I do hope, like I said, I tried to minimize the sources here to force you to think. I think this Rashi and Tosvot and the Gemara and Baba Matiya really do force you to think in very, very sharp ways. Are we agreed on this point? I, I think it was successful that way. Um, there are many other nafkaminas. I gave you just one more here. From the um, for, for the um, from the Balamor, which was um, the following, that the the um, some claimed that if the person buying, if there are two people who want to buy the field, one of them right is not a neighbor and is poor and wants to buy it to live on and work on. And, but the neighbor wants to buy it simply laharvacha, right, for investment for the future. So then the Balamor says, there is no Dina de Bar Metra. The neighbor who just wants to buy up this property for investment for the future, right, for harvacha, he doesn't have rights, Dina de Bar Metra. Now, why would you, why, why would you make a claim like that? So either you think like Tosva's last answer, right, which is that the Dean de Barmetra is formulated on practical, or he holds like Rashi, which is that, look, if it's one thing, if I want to own this land, that's one thing. But if I have no interest in holding on to this land long term, long term, I'm buying it as an investment, right? So then that's not fair. Why should I be able to stop this poor person from buying this land just because I have extra money lying around to buy a property I'm not going to do anything with for investment. That's not nice. So it could be that the Balamor holds like the last day in Toso, right, which is that the formulation of our metro is about practicality. And therefore, if I want to buy it to work, so it matters. But if I want to buy it to invest for the future, then no. Or he holds like Rashi and says, look, in the end of the day, if I want to buy it for my private use, so then it's the nice thing to do is to let the neighbor buy the land. But if I'm not buying it to use ever, I'm buying it as an investment, then I have no advantage. Right now, according to the first day in Tosvot, though, 
Yeah, but on the letter of the, of the law, it's still my pro- it's still the property that neighbors me, and therefore I should have rights to it. So according to the first day in Tosvot, vote, I would say that it doesn't matter why you want to buy it. Yeah. But according to the second day in Tosvot, vote or any of the days in Rashi, yeah. it might matter because again, if you think it's about practicality, then you have to look at who's practically going to be able to benefit from this land rather than who technically owns it. And if you think that I have to take into account the nice thing to do then obviously there's a difference between someone saying, I need more room in my house because, you know, I bought this small property when it was just me and my wife and now I have eight kids and I need to have a bigger house. And someone who's saying, look, I'm a millionaire. I'm buying the next door property. I could have bought the one down the street because I'm not doing it. I'm just waiting for the land price to go up. So Balamor could either be like Rabbeinu Avram or like Rashi, depending on what you want to say. Yonatan Ezra, go. Um, Could be. Right, again, you could. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I would tend to think that Balamor is like Rashi, but I could see why you'd say maybe it's the second day of Tosos that he's saying if you're investing in it rather than working it. So if you think the whole ichor of it is working, so I, I don't know. I had really thought that Balamor meant more, went more with Rashi, but as soon as you said that he might go like saying day of Tosos, I agree, it's possible. Um, but yeah, Ezra, um, last word, I guess. No, so this still be on the same price, right? Like, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. This is we didn't get into the pricing issues, but yes. And, and this is what I said, is that if you wanted to get into the pricing question, then we have to spend another month of this. It's, it's complicated, right? It's complicated. Okay. Um,